What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest number 198 at block height 603,618 on Wednesday, November 13th. So, what is cracking, Dean? Hello, hello. Nothing's cracking on this horse with eggs. <laughs> Nothing's cracking. Power structures, you know, governments stability it's not it's not not all cracking all over the world nothing nothing's cracking i think some reputations are cracking <laughs> now now that that's teasing it's spoilers all right this show is all about spoilers yeah but they gotta be at the right time for maximum funny all right so the first things up today uh two things that kind of form a yin and a yang we'll we'll start with the actual uh serious one so unchained capital um from austin texas uh just released a new multi-signature wallet tool called caravan and pretty much the the whole gist of this here is a bare bones system that uh, can interact with hardware wallets or um, any kind of software wallet out there just by importing you know manually um, different public keys to create a multi-sig setup with any kind of quorum of up to seven people that you want and like right now this this version is website based although like any web-based thing you can copy that run it locally on your own machine or even air gap it if you want to but um it's also something you can point at your own full node although it defaults to blockstream.info's api um, for balance information from the start and they are planning on actually extending this hopefully in the long term to uh, an actual desktop wallet and th this is really interesting because Unchained Capital's um, kind of service is a kind of a, a collaborative custody thing, like a cold storage vault, like Coinbase has, where you can use that as a cold storage, and they are one of the participants in the multi sig that gets set up for that. But they've kind of made this whole new tool now um, that ideally lets people use multi-sig for security and different types of storage setups without them having any involvement in the actual multi-sig and this is really fucking cool because um you know the announcement article on bitcoin magazine kind of the rationale for this is you're kind of stuck between using things like you know unchained vault or casa or blockstream green where some other party is one of the keys in the multi-sig or using things like a electrum or cypherx or armory and you know even electrum which is one of the most popular wallets out of there isn't really the easiest thing to get multi-sig set up with like that there's options out there but there's no real easy user-friendly way to do multi-sig without getting somebody else involved and this tool is is you know trying to be the start of that and it's you know again it's website based now but moving towards a desktop wallet implementation and then maybe generalizing as a library the, this could actually wind up being something that can just get dropped onto different um, foundations or have other software dropped on top of it to really start making multi-sig a lot more accessible and I think that's a really cool step forward. And I think, you know, it's kind of surprising that this is coming from 
a company whose you know main main product is you know let us be part of this multi-sig so i thought this is a pretty cool uh development so before uh we get into the the uh, yang side of this uh you have any uh any comments to toss in on this Janine? uh yeah i mean it just sounds really great i like seeing more easy to use multi-sig options because i think the stuff that's available now is okay but it's like it's really complicated to set up and so hopefully this makes it less complicated but um yes obviously obviously someone else uh that we are not a fan of has has uh tried to do something similar but not quite and um it's quite funny <laughs> yeah so um for those of you who remember uh mr wookie uh security expert extraordinaire um, spurging out over the uh, CASA issue regarding unauthenticated um, access over your local network. Um, I said at the time, watch Mr. Wookie. Um, he's been working on some secret multi-sig thing this whole time, and he's just shitting all over CASA because competition for my multi-sig thing. And yep, yep, I was right. Um, he He dropped the whole thing um and like jesus fucking christ i i don't even know where to start um this first of all or first of all um that this is kind of a python based solution to drop on top of bitcoin core with a little bit of javascript um to handle the multi-sig um stuff so first off um armory it's out there it's literally been out there since 2013, maybe even earlier. It was one of the first wallets I used in this space. You want hardcore fucking security? Use Armory. It's got at least half a decade track record of fucking auditing of people using it. It's the most rock solid, fully validating wallet out there. Like that's literally the wallet that Glacier Protocol was built for the most crazy secure type of cold storage system that you can do with consumer hardware out there so um yeah that's out there um use that if this is what you want to do um secondly um the the whole kind of trade-off here is um trying to move towards making it more accessible to people and the, the installation process kind of goes something um, like this. You go through this retardedly designed website with things broken up on individual pages for instructions, have to follow things through online, download um, the, the website, move the, the software for all of this over to an air-gapped computer, um, go through downloading core, um, you're going to need to actually get blockchain data um, to be able to manage on the air gap machine. Um, you have to actually physically remove um, the networking equipment from the laptop or whatever the hell you're going to use. So already we're getting way above the, the skill set of your average normie. Like, I can't even get half the people I know to understand something like Blockstream Green or Samurai properly. Like I, I have had people run into issues using Electrum for fuck's sake when I'm trying to, to explain how to actually manage their Bitcoin. So yeah, this is just absolutely absurd. And then in terms of the actual user interface, like the whole thing moving keys around is with a mnemonic scheme um, using the phonetic alphabet with checksums sprinkled through the whole thing. So any kind of process moving information around is going to be very time consuming, very horrible user experience. And it's like ultimately, really at the end of the day, this is just a joke of a shit show. Like if you're trying to be user friendly and accessible, nope you missed it by a thousand miles. Like there's no way in how a normal non-technical person can handle doing any of this. End of story. That's why things like CASA exist because they help those people. And if you want to actually lock things down, hardcore, handle your own security, 
go use Armory and use something like the Glacier Protocol because you, you, you should not be just using random wacky key storage methods and software uh, by incompetent idiots who clearly do not actually have the expertise that they project themselves as having. So like this is just, it's hilarious because of how bad it is, but it's also hilarious that just the first instinct of where my brain went when he was whining about Casa uh, was right as well. It's, it's just hilarious all around. Yeah, and I would like to point out, um, I mean, I haven't checked, I don't know if he released this on GitHub. I mean, there's been a couple of things where, like, he releases it on GitHub and then he t takes it down. But uh, just so everyone's aware, I don't think he's actually claiming to have built this. It was actually built, or am I thinking of something else? Didn't he say that his son built this, his quote son? I haven't been paying that much attention to detail, but you reminded me of, of one detail though. It's hilarious. Um, he's distributing this and trying to get people to download it through Google Drive. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's it. I mean, did he, it, like, is it, does he have hashes? Is it signed with a PGP key or anything? Or is that too much to expect? Um... I'm not sure, probably not, but I'm not downloading strange things from scammy idiots off of Google Drive. Um, no thanks. I'm I'm not downloading anything that I use for Bitcoin from Google Drive. <laughs> Period. Yep, so um yeah, this is just all around like hilarious. Like Mr. Security Expert has has somehow found the magic sweet spot in the middle where no this does not work if you want to be hardcore like competent security paranoiac and it doesn't work for complete noobs he is the perfect sweet spot in the middle where it's just just about completely useless it's it's hilarious i think it should have been called indomitable snowman <laughs> because it needs to be exiled yes yes it does um I I, th I really think that today Unchained uh, Capitals multi sig setup dropping while this this project from JW was on the news desk docket it, it was fate it, it really was I believe in a higher power now because they made this happen. <laughs> All right. Well, what uh, what are other higher powers up to? what low life higher powers are up to lately well um so the irs um has been reaching back out to some of the people who received the um what what was it called uh cp2000 notice um regarding not having properly filed their taxes for a uh, cryptocurrency and i want to say off the bat here that this is um it's not really clear whether this is actually responses coming from a human being or it's just automatically generated but most of the people who have actually um you know contacted the irs and gone through all of their records um are not actually being kind of held for the the taxes the irs is claiming they owe them um, in fact, in, a, in a one instance, um, somebody who was claimed to be overdue thousands of dollars in taxes actually wound up getting a refund um, after going through all the records. He, he find out that the IRS actually owed him money as opposed to the other way around. And, you know, I kind of want to bring this up and point out, like, this is not a cause for celebration. This is not a, oh, yay, we won. Um, they're being reasonable because they're effectively requiring you if they simply accuse you of, of not having handled your, your taxes properly, um, you have to submit all your information, all your transactional records. Like there is no way to settle that situation with the IRS except run away from this country and say, fuck off, I'm never coming back, suck a dick or completely dox all of your activity related to Bitcoin to actually prove, no, 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 your accounting is wrong. So this is literally creating a situation where the IRS now has the 
the capability and authority to just arbitrarily pick out any Bitcoiner and effectively get their entire transactional history. And again, it's not really too clear whether this is just like Coinbase records and things like that, or your actual on-chain um, transaction history, but it doesn't matter because one leads to the other if you know what you're doing. So you, you effectively can get just completely violated in terms of privacy by an arbitrary decision uh, from the IRS that you owe them more money. Um, on what basis? Who knows? So that's... Uh, yep. Nothing, nothing good can come from this, and it's just more shit fuckery from the IRS. I think By the way, I learned I learned that word from our good friends, uh, the Australians who do the honest government ads. <laughs> Those are some of my favorite memes on YouTube. I'm pretty sure they say the word shit fuckery every episode. What's another favorite word of mine? Chuckle fucks. That's one. I, I like I like chuckle fucks. <laughs> yep. But yeah, it's like I I don't think this is just shit fuckery. I think this is very well thought out. I I think we're at the point where it's time to stop looking at this as incompetence. Um, they're they're just trying to strangle things. They're trying to find weapons, leverage, any kind of of thing that they can hang over Bitcoiners' heads to ratchet up the amount of control they can exert. Because it's, it's past the point of, of any reasonable person, even idiots in government, to entertain the delusion that they can just shut Bitcoin off somehow. So this kind of shit is their only option. Like, I think this is very much intentionally done this way. Who says shit fuckery can't be intentional? <laughs> Touché. Touché. Alrighty, so... Should we look at some more shit fuckery? <laughs> yes, because I am actually very interested to hear this one. Um, I, I didn't see it before you threw it up on the news desk. Yeah, so I... Uh, basically, the first thing I saw this morning uh, was a bunch of messages from people pointing out that there is some talk about... One second... There's some talk about uh, Wire Messenger, which, um, if you follow me at all, is the thing that I recommend uh, above Signal because Wire allows you to create an account without using a phone number, which is something Signal, for whatever stupid reason they're still trying to maintain, does not allow you to do, and I hate that. Um, so Wire Messenger, uh, it has it's like a multi-device um, encrypted messaging app. And a lot of people recommend it, not only because it actually uses, I'm pretty sure it uses the same protocol as Signal, but it allows you to not, you know, use a phone. So that's great for a person like me who doesn't use a phone. Um, but some weird things have been happening in the past day, which is that people have discovered, well, actually it's, it's, so it was discovered, I think a week ago, but it only really caught people's attention I think in the last day or so, but basically the CEO of Wire, which I don't see where his name, I think it's Martin, Martin Brogger, um, he created a holding company in California. Now that's not, it's not, com it wouldn't be completely unusual for him to create a company in itself or set up some kind of entity in California because um, even though Wire is, I think, a German-based company, at least in terms of like where their main headquarters are. Um, they do list on, for example, their Twitter profile that they have some kind of operations in San Francisco and I think one other city I can't remember. But what people are concerned about is that in the privacy policy for Wire, it says that in the event that they, you know, something changes about their corporate structure or something like that, that they are going to notify people about that because it essentially means that they're going to be sharing, I mean, hopefully, you know, as the system is built, as they say, um, and it's mostly open source, that um, that it doesn't matter 
who gets the data because it's encrypted, but obviously they still get access to metadata and that might be revealing. Um, but basically they're supposed to notify people in some way about these kinds of changes. And so people are freaking out that, um, and actually I'm not sure. I think it's, I think they're based in either Germany or Switzerland. I can't remember. I know that they, I think they originally had a Swiss based company, but then their actual office was in Germany. I'm not quite sure. Um, a lot of, you know, distri distribution here. But people are worried about the fact that it's now been a day since a bunch of people, especially on Twitter, have been pointing out that this change happened recently. It wasn't announced. Um, they don't know why it happened. They think it was because um, as far as the discussion that's been happening on privacytools.io, uh, has been going. They think that the main reason is because they received money from a venture capital firm called Morpheus VC. I think that's what it's called. Um, but yeah, so the Wire Group Holdings Inc., which is the holding company, is based in Sherman Oaks, California. It was actually founded back in January. Um, and... So yeah, it used to be a, a Swiss company. It was the company was registered in Switzerland, but I guess they've recently moved it to San Francisco. I mean, the official location on their Wikipedia page, at least, is Mountain View, California. So yeah, just kind of confusing. And normally, when this kind of thing gets discovered, you get some kind of response, like almost immediately. But the Wire Twitter account has literally not said anything about this change or responded to the fact that there's a controversy or anything. So I don't know what's going on here. Um, no one else has noticed anything else suspicious besides this apparent change in the corporate structure, but I feel like people should pay attention to this because... Um, that's, I mean, basically, if they're if they're going to be moving the actual storage of data to the U.S., which I don't know if that's an automatic. I don't know if you can assume automatically that that's going to happen, just because they they change their headquarters or their main base of operations. But it's still probably not a comforting trend. So I think people should watch out for that. On the other hand. There are some people, um, including some, you know, famous whistleblower people who are kind of using this as an opportunity to divert users back to Signal. And I would just like to point out in case, um, in case it was not obvious that uh, Signal the Signal Foundation is also based in Mountain View, California. And actually, I think I might have mixed up. So, yeah, Wire says it's based in San Francisco, and Signal is based in Mountain View, California. Not too big of a difference. Same geographic region. But yeah, Signal is headquartered in Mountain View, California. So if you think that you're solving a problem uh, by going back to Signal, if you're worried about the geographic uh you know legal location of where your data is being stored um you didn't you're not going to solve anything by doing that and it also doesn't solve the problem that you still need a phone number to use signal um basically the only distinguishing factor there would be right now is you know maybe you're worried about the fact that they're not being completely transparent or forward about what's going on and why they made this change but other than that, I don't see any reason to move back to Signal purely for this reason. Yeah, uh, it's like this is definitely you know very reasonable to be cautious and apprehensive about this, but it's not a reason to jump ship. I mean, it's like ultimately all you can do with these kinds of platforms is minimize the metadata, and you know it's you you look at things there's a clear win here for wire like i i I'd, I'd rather use the thing that doesn't tie my phone number to it because you know the the comment you said that the ceo made about or, or somebody made about uh data being safe because it's encrypted um no it, that that does not mean it's safe 
if if a government gets their hands on that that encrypted data off of your servers, they can just hold on to that. That tr storage is very cheap. They can just toss that somewhere and let it sit there until they they compromise somebody's keys or maybe brute force some if technology really gets to the point that that's economically viable like data is not just safe in the long term because it's encrypted on somebody else's server like if, it, if it's on somebody else's server that's you you should assume that that's going to get scooped up in that way eventually yeah i mean that's definitely a concern also to um to answer for anyone who's not familiar with Wire, Wire does have a free version. It's kind of, if you don't know what you're doing, it's kind of hard to find on the website because they try to hide it, obviously. Um, you can do a free trial run if you want to do the paid version, but it, once that runs out, then the app stops working. Um, so you can do the paid version. You can also do, uh, I well, I think it's called Wire Pro. There's also a version for business and uh, another thing that people have been bringing up is that they apparently offer Wire Red, which is a ver it's a it's a version of Wire that they run um, that they built in collaboration with uh, the U.S. federal government, specifically for U.S. federal government employees. But I don't think. I mean, I hope that they're not running on the same infrastructure. But yeah, and also another question about. Telegram, yeah, Telegram is worse than Wire. Uh, I mean, in terms of the, in terms of the, the place where they're based, also in the U.S., also Telegram rolled their own crypto, hasn't been as well tested, isn't end to end encrypted by default. Like it's, you have to know what you're doing in the settings and enable it. Um, yeah, I just, I, and also requires phone numbers, so I. I've never used Telegram and I don't want to use it for that reason alone. So yeah, just, just keep, I really, this is new information to me and I still haven't gotten an answer on it, but I do feel kind of weird about the fact that they are not being, they're, they're not taking seriously that people are upset about this and they're not providing an answer, but hopefully they'll be able to figure that out in, you know, a few hours, a few days, I don't know, but this is really weird. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can come back and touch on this again when some more information drops. Alrighty, so to the next one. Yep. Alrighty. Uh, this is just going to be a quick one because there's not really too much concrete information here. Um, so. The CEO of What's Miner in China, um, I'm not even going to try that first name, Mr. Yang, uh, was arrested by the police. Um, and this, this was posted by uh, Mabel Zhang on Twitter uh, on the 8th with the statement that an undisclosed source alluded that this event is related to the IP dispute with Bitmain that What's Miner was involved in um, up to two years ago, I believe. Uh, we covered it. Um, and uh, Wang Chung actually made a number of public statements about that. That's what actually kind of brought it to the attention of people in the West. Uh, he, he was pretty much calling out Bitmain for patent trolling um, other smaller miner companies. But, you know, at the same time, I'm also hearing things through back channels that uh, I'm not going to be specific, but that this was pretty much just him doing something stupid personally and has nothing whatsoever to do with Bitmain or the IP um, litigation between the two companies. So th this is, is kind of just really up in the air from my point of view, e even digging around and trying to talk to a few people about this, um, that there is really nothing definitive here, I can say, except he was arrested. Um, I, I can't really say one way or another whether this is related to the shenanigans with Bitmain or completely disconnected. So uh, in, until something more detailed makes its way out of China, I mean, that's really all we got on this one folks in other news though um mccree zan has responded to jihan wu's shady little 
coup or whatever you want to call it uh, with Bitmain. Um, and this is this is probably going to be a regular thing um, that, that we're going to keep coming back to as this develops. But uh, he posted, um, after, I forget if this was on WeChat or um, an email, but the, the English translation is, is really kind of interesting. Um, I, I have never thought that as a person focusing on technology and product, I have to start thinking from legal perspectives. It, it was embarrassing that as a Bitmain co-founder, the biggest shareholder and a registered legal representative, I got ousted without any knowledge of this coup while on a business trip. I didn't realize until then that those scenes in TV shows where you get stabbed in your back by those partners you've trusted and brothers you've fought with can really happen in real life. Bitmain is our child. I will fight for her till the end with legal weapons. I won't allow those who want to plot against Bitmain to succeed. If somebody wants a war, we will give them a war. Um, and he also... Um, goes on to say he envisions Bitmain reaching its goal, um, something I've never um, heard stated anywhere as a goal, of dominating 90% of the Bitcoin mining equipment market while expanding its AI business. So this is really kind of illuminating in that, you know, there is, in my opinion, this shows there is definitely a very personal element of this between Jihan and, and Zan and not just how they want to approach the, the company itself, but just purely personal. Like I, I see no reason why he, he would make those very melodramatic comments about TV shows and brothers stabbing you in the back without some kind of personal element. Here. But the, the little nugget though is the end when he specifically states it is a company goal to dominate at least 90% of the Bitcoin mining equipment market. So that, that this, this, like all the shenanigans aside going on to the Bitmain civil war that we're going to keep coming back to, right here, monopolizing mining for this system was an explicit company goal. And that's just out there and confirmed now. Mm, wait a second. I remember someone else saying that they wanted 90% dominance in an area of the industry. Who is that? Oh, right. It was Coinbase saying that they wanted to, what was it, control 90% of the the market share or the market cap or something like that. I can't remember the exact word they used, but they said that they wanted to control 90% of that. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's almost like these companies that to people paying attention are obviously malicious actors in this space actually are malicious actors in this space. Hmm. But yeah, so this is this is going to be an interesting thing to follow and keep coming back to. Uh, we'll see you the next time something pops up in the Bitmain Civil War. Uh, next up, though, I think uh, Janine has a little something interesting going on in china as well yeah uh, it's pretty short um unfortunately i think that the tweet um one of the tweets in this got deleted so i haven't had a chance to look it up in an archive but there is apparently a um security camera company called hick vision which is like sounds like a sounds like a company that came out of the south or something um worst name ever uh and basically they have recently been marketing a product that claims to detect uh people's ethnicity and specifically to detect uh Uyghurs, uh which if you've been paying attention to all of the controversy with the nba censoring teams and fans at NBA games and stuff like that and a bunch of other things where wherever Chinese VC or the Chinese government has a lot of influence um, basically there's been a lot of investigation into 
whether the uh, Uyghur minority in China is being basically put into concentration camps. There's accusations of forced sterilization and all kinds of other horrible things going on there. And so basically, I mean, this is kind of, if this kind of product is successful, I would say that that's it's pretty much confirmation that something horribly wrong is going on and this is happening on a broad scale because the only reason that a company would buy i mean oh god i like there's so many questions i have about it like there there's been so many facial recognition type scams that have been going on over the co- past couple of years where they claim to identify so and so you know doing a crime or they can they can predict someone before they uh, do a crime or whatever, and it all ends up being mostly garbage because the, the these algorithms are not unbiased and they're built on some pretty eh, like broken assumptions about people and how they act and. So I, if I was in China, I mean, it's not like they don't have a history of this. I would be extremely afraid if I was a person who, you know, I, especially if I was a Uyghur or if I even look, you know, was someone who resembled that ethnicity, I would be extremely afraid that I was going to get accidentally caught by one of these cameras. Um, we've already seen another example of that happening where... Um, I mean, slightly different, but there was a woman who was repeatedly being fined and harassed because she was being accused of jaywalking all the time. And she was completely confused because she's like, I'm not jaywalking. I don't know why this is happening. Please stop finding me and harassing me. Uh, because that's that's what a lot of these um, social credit systems turn into is basically these hyper, hyper, uh, I don't know really like systems that they they when you get caught doing something or if you just get misidentified caught doing something they'll put your face on a billboard and encourage people in your local area to harass you if they come upon you and it also happens on trains as well and a whole bunch of horrible side effects and there's a woman who is like i said getting repeatedly fined for jaywalking and it turns out that the reason she was getting fined is because her face was on a uh on an advertisement that was on the side of a bus and so every time the bus was going down the road on streets that had these facial recognition cameras the cameras were capturing her face and thinking that she was a person jaywalking across the road and that's what ended up happening so with that in mind, you know, something that can happen that easily where no no human was involved in checking that. Like if anyone had actually looked at the footage and said, okay, this is clearly an advertisement that is not a person crossing the road, that would have never happened. So I feel like the chances of that happening again here are pretty high where there's not going to be a human being checking and you're going to have... I mean, they shouldn't be imprisoned, period, but you're going to have people being imprisoned on the basis of, you know, looking like an ethnicity that is being targeted, and that's really disgusting. Computer say you she, that mean you she. Okay, bad South Park accent. Yeah. Uh... I have no idea what you were just referencing there. I have not watched enough South Park. The shape part, huh? But um, yeah, this is just like terrifying. Uh, surveillance is is already omnipresent in our lives, baked into everything, and it, it it's I don't I don't know why it shocks me so much, but it's just to actually see a system like this uh, advertised, proposed as something that can literally su- target and surveil people based on their race or ethnicity is insane like what what even assuming like there is some moral argument for this level of surveillance and we should have all of this to make sure people are good what the fuck does does your ethnicity have to do with it like this is just crazy 
Like how blatant do things have to get before people realize that these systems are nothing but ways to enforce control for the people on top? That's it. End of story. Nothing. That There is no other goal or purpose for these things existing except a system of control. That's it. Yeah, and I'm actually, at the moment, I'm reading the Gulag Archipelago, and I'm trying to find it right now, but I remember there being a specific passage early on um, where I think it was like a member of the Soviet government where they they made a declaration, oh yeah, I found it. So they made a declaration in November 1918 um, in a newspaper, Red Terror, where they said we are not, and then obviously this is about class, not ethnicity, but they said we're not fighting against a single individual. We're exterminating um, the bourgeoisie as a class. It is not necessary during the integration to look for evidence proving that the accused opposed the Soviets by word or action. The first question which you should ask him is what class does he belong to? What is his origin, his education, his profession? These are the questions which will determine the fate of the accused. And so I feel like, I mean, China's, if it's, if it's not there already, they're probably in that same type of mindset about this where they're saying, you know, you belong to a certain ethnic group, that ethnic group, are, we're targeting it. We don't care if you've ever committed an actual crime or hurt anybody. We're just going to, we're, we're going to ruin your life and take you away from your family and destroy your community. So, yeah, I was just thinking about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, a little, little tangent before we move on, but like that, that, that's something people like don't appreciate about China. Like it's not just the Chinese, like China is one of the most diverse countries in terms of ethnic populations in the world. And it's the Han that pretty much run everything now. And like they, they are very much establishing a racial hierarchy. Like that's the whole thing. Like they they they've gone so far in this that they are literally like slowly, calculatedly attempting to absorb other ethnic groups that they deem not like the Uyghurs, like just fuck you into the Han. Like they they are literally trying to guarantee that the Han ethnicity in China is the only genetically dominant ethnic group. And like, it's fucking crazy. Like it, it is literally the type of eugenist attitude that was predominant in Nazi Germany. And it's literally been running a country, a superpower for decades. And everybody just turns a blind eye. They pretend it doesn't exist. They just pretend that the Chinese are just a, a single ethnic homogenous group. And it's, that's not what's going on. All right. Uh, straight into next thing from tangent yeah i mean the next thing isn't that different it's in in the realm of building social credit systems that are probably going to be used for surveillance and control uh but once again facebook has patented something that should scare the shit out of people and whenever people discover what facebook or google or whatever has patented their immediate response to that is oh you know we patent things that doesn't mean we're building a system for it we just patent things it's like okay but you you don't just patent things for no reason you patent things because you think the idea or concept is valuable which is still a scary concept when it comes to things like this which is um, I mean, it's not too complicated. I haven't read the entire patent, but the part that is being focused on is basically that the patent they got approved was that they will be um, having users, and obviously they're going to be doing this too, but apparently they want to allow users to compare their financial transactions to the financial transactions of a group. For example, um, a similar age group or a similar location group or a similar interest group and the picture that um was tweeted by um the guy that we're going to link in the description it it shows basically the first graph is these uh or the first couple of pictures is three graphs and the first one says transaction category 
and it has three bars. One is for clothing, dining, and gas. And the bars are higher or lower based on did you spend more on this one or this one or this one. And so it says in this picture, your transaction history, and it has the highest bar being clothing, followed by dining, and then gas. And then it shows a graph next to that, which is user group transaction history. And it shows that for this user group, on average, clothing is the smallest, uh, followed by gas, and then dining is the highest. Um, gas and dining are almost equal. Um, and so then after that, it has a graph that it um, compares basically your categories to the user group category and tells you like what percentile you're in, you know, based on your spending choices. So like you're you're in. D depending on how you distribute your money and what you spend it on, you'll be categorized based on that. And they have a really f weird tag at the bottom where it says, your transactions are compared to other users having an age within a threshold of your age in your current location and sharing your interests in the British royal family and kickboxing. So that's what they chose as the interest examples is British royal family and kickboxing, which is like, okay. <laughs> um yeah, I feel like I I mean, I don't know that that's I guess I don't know how many people still have that, but um and then they have another uh image below that where it has budget and it says that others with similar transaction amounts for dining and entertainment spent $300 on travel last month. Consider setting a budget of $300 for travel. So it's basically not only comparing your transaction history to other people's transaction history, but it's giving you recommendations on how to adjust your spending based on what other people are doing, which, you know, there are some ways that you could build that type of application where it wasn't a complete privacy black hole. Um, if you were able to actually figure out how to anonymize that data better, but I highly doubt that any of this data is going to be anonymized. It, at least, well, it'll be anonymized from the user's perspective, but it won't be anonymized from Facebook's perspective or whatever company is running this kind of system. So yeah, in the same realm, financial surveillance is increasing and they're basically going to sell it to people by saying, well, don't you want to know how to adjust your budget, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, but I don't want Facebook telling me how to adjust my budget. Thank you. Because at the end of the day, um, I mean, it's a different topic, but there's been this whole controversy with um, how Apple, the Apple card is coming to conclusions about, you know, what, what your uh, credit worthiness is. And there was a big storm about that. Um, but the, basically the, the one thing that everyone can get out of both of these is that the average person at these companies is not going to actually understand how the algorithm works, even if the people who build it understand how it works, they're not going to know. And so when you're getting these recommendations for how much you should be spending or what you, you should be spending it on, uh, unless the algorithm is open source and you can actually figure out how it's coming to its conclusions, you're not going to know what is influencing these recommendations. And so you're going to get the financial surveillance and you're going to get, you know, hidden influences into these recommendations of how to spend your money, which if, you know, if you're willing to do that, okay. But remember, Facebook is the company that you can run whatever shitty ads you want and they will appear and they will, you know, there, there's not a lot of quality control going on um, because they, they don't make money off of quality control. So I'm not, I would not be interested in using this. Yeah, this, um... This creeps the living shit out of me for multiple reasons. Um, first off, have they even considered uh, running this through uh, like threat models involving statistical attacks? What if I refine the group I'm interested in comparing myself to enough that I can just literally statistically go through and isolate those people to individuals, like tie individual activity by just crunching the numbers through a small enough group that I construct by, by what inputs I get into it? Or what about 
the, the use of this, obviously like companies are going to jump on this. So you can actually get like spending statistic averages for whole groups of consumers and shit. Now you can really get shady with those subliminal advertising tricks to push people over the edge and shit because you know the margins that they have available in, in, in their budget if you can look at things and average things out statistically. Like this just seems like the most horrendous idea. Not to mention just the, the creepy social aspect of this. I mean, if the if we can take away one thing from the history of of social media in dot com bubble 2.0, it's the creepy peer pressure to conform and converge onto the behavior of a group. That is just creepy that they are are pushing things into the platform that will take that to the level of your spending habits. Yeah, I mean, I every time a system like this, and by the way, this as far as we know, they haven't built this system yet. It's just been patent. The patent has been approved, so I they wouldn't have done any tests on it because I don't think the system exists, or at least it's not publicly known that it exists. But yeah, that's that's the problem that I see all the time is that some company or project will claim that they collect this data, but it's anonymized in quotes, and they never explain how they anonymize it, and it always ends up being really shitty and badly done to the point where you can isolate the individual data points and it's broken. Um, so that would not surprise me at all if that happened, if they built this and they overlooked that. Mm -hmm. And that's like a scary fucking thing. Like that, it's just like, like how many times does shit going wrong have to get rubbed in people's face before they realize that these platforms are not trustworthy like we can do these things better why does everybody keep walking with open arms into the broken dangerous alternative yeah and also once again um it's noticeable that this is facebook doing this and it's a financial data analysis application which means that facebook is clearly becoming more and more interested in doing finance related things uh whether whether libra will go anywhere is another question but clearly they want to do more things uh, combining social media and money uh which ugh, gross all right so should we jump along into a little more positive news yep so Matt Odell, uh, shout out to, to the freaks who might be listening, uh, tweeted about this the other day, and I am really excited by this project Kumo Chat. Uh, in, in the last episode, I kind of went through um, the messaging over the Lightning Network app that's being worked on at Lightning Labs, and then the issues I had with it. Um, this Kumo Chat thing is perfect. It's literally just a back and front end um, that's set up to allow people to buy uh, temporary self-destructing uh, chat rooms that are end-to-end -end encrypted over the Lightning Network. And like this is exactly what I was saying talking about the, the project from Lightning Labs. Like Disconnect the message passing for your communications from the payment. Like There's no reason to keep those concerns um, interconnected so tightly. But the, there's kind of a couple uh, shit talkers in the, the thread um, under the, the tweet Matt made, kind of going in, um, in a very skeptical direction. Like one of the things displayed on the, the client by default um, is your messages are never saved to a database. And, and everybody's immediately obviously calling out, well, how do you prove that? Like you can't say that if you're not running it yourself. Um, you know, how, how do you know that's not stored in the database? And an interesting thing I, I was thinking, um, and obviously if you're not running this yourself, you would still have to trust that somebody is running it in this way. But why not set a, a backend server up for something like this on a RAM only machine? Something that literally does not have any storage connected to it. Just live boot something on it set up a hidden service over Tor and run this completely on the RAM. And hell, you could even take that a step further and create some kind of authentication feature 
um, if you want to, to just turn the machine off remotely. And then whoosh, there goes everything in the RAM. And it's like, you know, I, I, I definitely appreciate and encourage skepticism, especially when it comes to things like privacy tools and encryption. But like, let's think how to fix things here instead of just shit talk the new thing. I think that would be really fucking awesome if instead of using third party things like, like wire or telegram or signal or whatever, people just took old desktops and set up hidden services like this. Start running distributed things yourself that are end to end encrypted where you can actually take the proper precautions to make sure nothing winds up in a persistent database. And people can actually go around and use these, these types of chats ran by people that they know and trust are actually doing this properly like that would be pretty fucking awesome so like stop talking shit start start talking solutions come on jimmy i need uh, give me one comment come on one comment yeah i mean i me i'm i'm interested to see how this goes and what the user experience is and yeah, don't don't ever say that nothing ever gets saved to a database because I mean, assuming even if even if everything works, um, the person on the other end of the channel that you're talking to could be saving all your messages, and that's always important to remind people. Just because you're using an application that securely transmits a message does not mean that the end user device is secure and could be doing things, and they could be saving messages. So. But that's a problem with every single messaging app. Um, so I'm interested to follow this. I don't know if I would necessarily use it, but it might be useful in the event that you need to communicate um, with someone running a lightning node or you have a channel open with them. And I don't know, for whatever reason, there's something going wrong with your connection or it would be it would possibly be a good avenue to be troubleshooting stuff where you don't want to do an out of band uh, communication channel where maybe you don't have that set up and you might identify yourself by doing that. So maybe it would be useful for that. But other than that, I don't not sure at this point. And that, that's another thing. Uh... I just thought of is, you know, a nice thing about this is like, it's actually integrating lightning to, to finance itself. But like the, the way this is set up, like you don't have to have a lightning channel just to be able to message people. Like you just need somebody to pay the, the lightning fee to set up a chat room. So like that, that's another aspect of that. that that's really cool. Like you, you disconnect those layers of concern whenever you can Alrighty, blockstream overlords are getting real angry with me because i haven't made a blockstream story the first story in a long time god save me but um <laughs> this is uh just the the fourth uh series in the, their uh post series on medium about different sea lightning plugins and this one I, I think is, is going to be really quick, but I just want to illustrate a, a nice point that this proved. So the C Lightning API um, made some changes. Um, you used to have the, the call function list payments um, to show the actual payments your node has made. And that has been broken into list pays and list send pay. And the reason that this was split up is because, you know, in the long term, there, there are plans to break up um, payments so that, you know, I could effectively pay you three individual payments over the Lightning Network to make a single purchase. And so they separated the API calls here um, in order to, you know, start getting ready for that kind of functionality. You, if you are interested in the purchases, you use list pays. If you are interested in the actual individual low level payments on Lightning, you call list send pay. Um, and this, this broke um, Spark Wallet. So Rusty Russell, um, literally in, he was able to fit this in a single tweet, uh, wrote a tiny little plugin that would simply call list 
pays and lists send pay and it like sort things out. Um, or wow, well, I'm hold on, I'm retarded. Um, it, it would call list uh, send pay and parse things through list payments, so that an old version of Spark Wallet could access the existing new API with the old API call. And hilariously, um, literally within an hour or two, the new version of Spark Wallet was released, the set up to call the the new API functions. But I just think it's it's really awesome to think. That, that that's a huge issue when it comes to people building applications on top of an API like this. Like changes in the API cause big problems like this. It breaks compatibility. But because of the the entire plugin architecture that that C Lightning is really trying to push as hard into the the core of the, the daemon architecture as possible, it, it literally took enough code that you can fit it in a tweet to make a plugin to just let whatever was built on top continue functioning with the old API call that it was programmed with. And that is just like, you know, it's the, the flexibility and the utility for developers and application builders that the way C Lightning is being architected, it's, it's just, the benefits are amazing. Like this is what you want to make it as easy and simple and, and the least amount of headaches possible to be building shit on top of C Lightning. And that is like, eventually those compounding returns are just going to push Lightning forward at light speed because there will not be a million things you have to figure out to just build something. You just write the plugins you need, build your application, drop it on top. And so like that's just fucking awesome. All right now. Here's some news you're not going to be so happy about. So, um, CVE uh, 2017 18350 uh, was just uh, disclosed in Bitcoin Core. So this was a bug that was introduced in one of the release candidates for 0.7 in 2012 and was fixed with a hidden patch in 2017. So this has been patched for the past two years. Um, now, first off, I'm gonna say, if you just flip your node on and just run it, um, th this is not anything you need to worry about. But the issue was a vulnerability in the SOX 5 support um, that actually allowed um, overwriting data in the the stack buffer used for communicating and you do some malicious shenanigans but the, the core point here is you you would effectively have to be connected to somebody else's proxy server that is actually doing something malicious like if, if you are on your machine if you are just using this to plug into tor or something as long as those connections are on your machine this should be fine. Um, you should have nothing to worry about. You've already been patched for years. Um, if you don't use Tor or anything, there was never an issue for you. So it's it's really like it, it just goes to show, you know, sometimes shit happens. Um, but in a lot of the cases, the the kind of potential for damage here is not that great. Like th this would be something that could have attacked users using um, third party proxy servers to hide network connections or somebody using that functionality to remotely access their, their, their node. So this is pretty much something the vast majority of users um, were never really in any kind of practical worry. But nonetheless, um, you still have to acknowledge these things eventually. And so it's two years, like, I don't know how many different fucking versions we've been through. Uh, three full release versions, I think. Um, you know, it's time to put it out. If you are running a node that out of date still, uh, get off your lazy ass and update it. So I think that's uh, that's that. That brings us to you, Janine, and the last story. Yeah, so the last one is not really a 
Bitcoin story, but in an interview clip that was widely shared, uh, the CEO of Uber, uh, Dara Khosrowshahi, can't pronounce, probably butchered his last name, but he was being questioned by someone from um, Axios HBO, apparently as a television show. I don't have HBO, so I don't know. Uh, he was being questioned about their relationship with the Saudi government, uh, considering three things that the Saudi government's, oh, well, this wasn't mentioned, but basically the Saudi government, um, the public investment fund has a 5% stake in Uber. SoftBank, which is backed by the public investment fund, owns 15%, which means that the Saudi government effectively influences uh, somewhere around one fifth of Uber's, or yeah, one fifth of Uber's stake. Uh, and the director of the public investment fund is also a board member of Uber. That was the guy that they mentioned during the clip. Um, it wasn't explicitly stated. I can't remember, but he uh, he then replies. The CEO replies that the because um, the the interviewer brings up um, the death of Jamal Khashoggi, and you know, are you trying to distance yourselves from them? That was basically the implication of his question. He was asking like, w why didn't you show up to you know this specific event? Blah blah blah. And the CEO replies, the Saudi government said they made a mistake. It's a serious mistake, but we've made serious mistakes too, right? We're self-driving and we stopped driving and we're recovering from that mistake. I think that people make mistakes. It doesn't mean that they can never be forgiven. I think they have been, they have taken it seriously, end quote. Um, yeah, so if you want to know more about what happened with that, um, I've tweeted about <laughs> Jamal Khashoggi's murder and the involvement of hacking team in that in training the guy who led the kill team that was basically, um, according to a lot of investigations into this, including the UN, uh, was basically being sanctioned by the crown prince himself. And in fact, the leader of the kill team that basically chopped his body up and just very gruesomely killed him. Uh, he was an employee of someone who was working directly with the crown prince. So the idea that this was just a mistake, like, oh, you you slipped on the rug and your hacksaw, you know, chopped off all this guy's body parts, that's, that's, that's ludicrous. That's, that's insane. So... Um, after people like me were understandably very pissed about these statements, uh, Dara tweeted, There is no forgiving or forgetting what happened to Jamal Khashoggi, and I was wrong to call it a mistake. As I told uh, Dan, Dan was the interviewee, after our interview, I said something in the moment that I don't believe. Our investors have long known my views here, and I'm sorry I wasn't clear, as clear on Axios. Um, yeah. Meh. Boo. Yeah, I it don't was just so. a mistake. You know, he just accidentally fucking brutally murdered this guy. Whoopsies. Yeah, and now I just, you know, accidentally engaged in apologism for the government that was responsible for that. Yeah, cool. Um, no. So, yeah, I don't know how someone could fuck up that badly if you they didn't believe in what they were saying. So um, I find that really hard to see. And I think that he just got caught with his pants down and didn't perceive the consequences of saying that because he's the CEO of Uber. Um, guess what? CEOs of Uber do not have a good track record. Uh, but the reason I bring this up uh, to once again remind people is that I criticized the Civil Blockchain Journalism Project uh, last year because it was basically being spearheaded by consensus and consensus, um, S Y S, not S E S or S U S, whatever. Um, they have a partnership with the Saudi telecom company, uh, since I think last year, 2017, I don't remember when it started exactly, but they've had this partnership and their business operations guy, John Lillick, uh, like this CEO of Uber expressed, uh, some very predictable and douchey skepticism about whether Khashoggi was murdered and whether this murder uh, had the involvement of the Saudi government uh, and the sanction of the Saudi government, particularly the crown prince. Um, in addition, the head project manager of the Ethereum Foundation said in an interview this summer that it would be really great if the Saudis invested a trillion dollars in Ethereum, which is bleh. Um, so yeah, I've... 
I've still seen no pushback from people in the Ethereum space about this, really. Like, I see people in Ethereum and Bitcoin, you know, spreading awareness about, oh, Uber's a shitty company, look what the CEO said, but at the same time, they're not holding their own people and their own companies to account. So um, I find it pretty disturbing that nobody is bothered by the fact that the two most influential organizations in the Ethereum space are enthusiastically working with the Saudi government to, I don't know, have blockchains solve their regional crisis or some bullshit like that. Like, yeah, you're going to end war with your blockchain. Good. Yeah. I don't think, especially not yours. No. So yeah, just, this was another way for me to bring that up again, because I feel like it's like, I just, I have no, there's, there's absolutely no moral similarity between me and anyone who's, you know, high up involved in Ethereum, or at least I don't perceive it that way because I don't see them having an issue with this. Um, even during the delete Coinbase stuff, uh, no one, I didn't see much pushback from people in Ethereum about that either. So I don't get the impression that they give a shit about any of this stuff. And yet at the same time, they claim to be, I don't know, d- Badger puffing unicorn riding developers who think the world is made of rainbows, or at least they want to make it full of rainbows, and they think they can do that while riding on the blood money wave of these governments. So yeah, mm-hmm. and you know, I it's like we 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 don't need excuses to to cover stories like this anymore. I mean, like Bitcoin intersects with a lot of the political interaction between technology and people who want to spread truth and hide truth. Like there's, there's no need for an excuse anymore. These things are very related, but yeah, this is just, (laughs) well, my brain is not capable of doing anything, but yelling and motherfucking right now. So you want to move into final thoughts? Yeah, I um I actually have several today. So the first one is um that apparently as of yesterday the ACLU is saying that uh in one of their cases I unfortunately I I would butcher everyone's names who are the uh the the plaintiffs in this case, but Basically, it looks like they've been involved in a federal court case regarding the constitutionality of uh, border searches of people's smartphones and laptops at airports and other other U.S. ports of entry. And apparently it has been determined by this federal court that that is a violation of the Fourth Amendment. So that is pretty amazing. Now, whether that's actually going to be followed or not is you know shrug no idea but that's uh pretty cool news that i saw yesterday um the other thing is that there is going to be a important event on november 27th so let's see about two weeks from now yeah about actually exactly two weeks from now um there's going to be an event at the Bundestag in Berlin, um, Medien unter Beschuss, um, Media Under Attack, uh, about, um, I mean, I think the, the broader thing is media freedom and threats against journalists in general, but there's going to be a lot of WikiLeaks people or WikiLeaks supporters there who are going to be speaking, um, about those issues. And I think even the, um, the very famous, uh, anything to say sculpture um if you haven't seen it it's basically three statues uh edward stone assange and chelsea manning uh years ago before she transitioned um there's three statues and there's a fourth chair they're all there so all the statues are standing on chairs and then there's a fourth chair that you can stand up on uh to stand with them it's really cool interactive sculpture and Apparently, I don't know, I haven't checked where it's going to be, but uh, supposedly it's going to be somewhere in the vicinity, probably outside of the Bundestag building. So 
Um, it is a, an event that's open to the public if you register. So if you happen to be in the area, then I would recommend going. All right. And my final thought uh, is actually going to be something serious today for a change. Um, so yesterday, no, two days ago, Charlie Kirk, the founder and president of Turning Point USA, and chairman of uh, Trump Students, uh, student organization supporting Trump, uh, tweeted about Ross Ulbricht. Uh, more specifically, how infuriated he is. The, the more he digs into and learns the specifics uh, about Ross's case and how he wound up with the sentence that he, he got. And I, I want to drive home the point here. This, regardless of whatever you think of, of the right, the Republican Party of these specific organizations is irrelevant. There is a core point here that you should pay attention to and ignore everything else. This is a mainstream Christian conservative who is heading very well-known right-wing political organizations with ties to supporting Trump voicing public outrage at what happened to Ross. There is an actual chance, I think, at this point to actually get his situation in front of President Trump to consider a pardon for. So everybody out there who is showing up to these Trump rallies and voicing support for Ross, everybody who is still actually taking the time to explain what really happened to people who don't know anything except the, the typical media propaganda, keep doing it. Because we are actually seeing concrete results, people standing up publicly with the type of profile that actually might get this in front of President Trump. And that is his only hope at this point. So keep it up. Like we're actually starting to see results now. On that note, um, adios everybody. We will see you next time, punks. Auf Wiedersehen.